Landidnow, the largest seaside resort in Wales, brings in nearly 9.4 million visitors per year. The majestic town is renowned for its sweeping bay and Victorian-era architecture. It is uniquely situated between the Great and Little Ormes and boasts two picturesque beaches. Sophie Louise Hook was a seven-year-old girl born to Julie and Christopher Hook in Cheshire, England on the 27th of May in 1988. Julie was a teacher and Christopher worked at an advertising agency. The couple had gotten married in 1984 and had four children, Gemma, age nine, Sophie, seven, Joseph, five, and little Ellie, one. Gemma and Sophie in particular were extremely close and loved playing together. Neighbors spoke of a warm, happy family, with Sophie being the most extroverted of the children. Sophie was described as a bubbly and sweethearted girl. The family was extremely close with Julie's sister, Fiona, and her husband, Danny Jones, who lived in Landed now in North Wales. The Joneses, much like the Hooks, also had four young children. Those close to the families recall that the bond between the eight of the children was so strong that they were more akin to siblings than cousins. On July 29, 1995, the Joneses extended an invitation to the Hooks to join in celebrating their son, Luke's ninth birthday. On that morning, the Hooks had breakfast before embarking on the 90-minute journey from Cheshire to Landidnow to attend the celebration. The Jones family's spacious residence on Bryn Labia Road in Landidnow was valued at 200,000 pounds in 1995. The backyard was secluded, separated from the overgrown bridle path that was used for horseback riding by a hedge and a wooden gate. The space proved an ideal setting for an afternoon of fun, with the kids enjoying themselves in a splash pool, playfully spraying each other with a garden hose, and exploring a new tent gifted by their grandparents, Pearl and Paul Roberts, for the birthday celebration. The kids adored the new tent and begged their parents to sleep in it in the backyard that night. Julie and Christopher were not too worried as the garden was secure and close to the bright patio lights. Additionally, Fiona and Danny were sleeping just a few meters away inside the house. Julie and Christopher recall kissing their children goodnight when they left them to their camping sleepover in the garden. Julie later recalls that she kissed them goodbye and said to them, quote, have a good time, I'll see you tomorrow. This would be the last time they would ever see seven-year-old Sophie alive. Sophie, her sister, and two of their cousins, Luke and Alex, settled down in their sleeping bags in the tent. They ate dinner, played games, and shared ghost stories. Feeling scared, the younger boy, Alex, opted to head indoors at 12.30 a.m. At 12.40 a.m., his father, Danny, decided to check up on the kids before going to sleep. He left the back door open in case any of the kids decided to come inside. At 2.30 a.m., Sophie's cousin, Luke, woke up, checked the time, and noticed that Sophie was still in the tent, asleep between himself and her sister. He went back to bed. However, the next morning, Luke woke up around 7.15 a.m. and found his cousin Sophie missing from the tent. The tent's entrance was open and damp from the morning rain. Luke noticed that while Sophie was gone, Sophie's beloved stuffed giraffe, named Blankies, whom she took everywhere, remained inside the tent. He knew that she and Blankies were inseparable, and later said, quote, If Sophie had run away, she would have taken him with her. Luke immediately notified his parents. Fiona and Danny searched the garden and the house, as well as the surrounding fields, for over an hour, but no trace of Sophie could be found. Sophie was officially reported missing to the police at 8.20 a.m. Unbeknownst to Sophie's family, an hour earlier, around the time Luke had woken up and found Sophie missing, a gruesome discovery was made by a local man. At 7.10 a.m., 55-year-old Jerry Davies set off from home to begin his usual dog walk down North Shore Beach. While walking along the shore, he spotted what appeared to be a discarded mannequin. 
However, he knew something was wrong when his dogs became alarmed and ran away from the scene. He decided to investigate the mannequin, only to realize it was the body of a girl. Davies took off his t-shirt and laid it over her lifeless body before rushing to a nearby phone box in order to dial 999, the country's emergency number. The girl was later identified as Sophie Hook. Her unclothed body was found washed up on the beach half a mile away from her home. The following autopsy report is extremely graphic and viewer discretion is advised. The autopsy revealed that Sophie had been brutally attacked. Her right upper arm and her ankle had been broken. She had been slapped and punched and her body was covered with bruises. She had suffered internal bleeding and was sexually assaulted. The medical examiner noted that a majority of her injuries were comparable to those normally suffered by people killed or seriously injured in major car crashes. All of the injuries were sustained while she was still alive. The coroner said that during the attack, Sophie had been in so much pain that she left teeth marks on both sides of her tongue and inside her lower lip. She ultimately died of strangulation. Her body had been thrown into the sea near a cliff called the Little Orme, located at the eastern end of the promenade. Her time of death could not be determined as her body temperature had dropped due to the cold seawater. It was determined that her body had been in the water for at least three hours. The crime shocked the town. Sophie's family was inconsolable. Her mother said, quote, Gemma is coping extremely badly. She is totally and utterly distraught, and it is very difficult to comfort her. She is so utterly sad and angry. Gemma later said, quote, I want to be in heaven with Sophie. Police had a difficult task of finding the killer, as the killer had tried to remove any forensic evidence by throwing her body into the sea. Her clothes, a distinctive pink and white Winnie the Pooh night dress, her underwear, and a pair of Marks and Spencer socks embossed with pink flowers, were never found. Authorities believe whoever murdered Sophie knew that the children were staying in the garden tent. Police started their investigation by interviewing all the nearby registered sex offenders. Soon, investigators would focus upon one individual in particular, a 30-year-old man named Howard Hughes. He was known to ride his mountain bike through the coastal town late at night. He had a striking appearance as he grew up quite rapidly due to a chromosome abnormality called XYY syndrome. He reached six feet tall by age 11 and was towering at six feet eight inches in adulthood. He also had behavioral problems, learning disabilities, and dyslexia as a child. Growing up, Hugh's father enrolled him in private schools in hopes that they could make a positive impact on him. However, after merely two terms, Lindisfarne College in Wednesday, Wexham, declined to continue his enrollment. Despite his father's attempt to double their fees, the school refused to retain Hughes as a pupil. They said he had a tendency to engage in fights and to bully other students. This pattern of disruptive behavior carried through his teenage years and into his adult life. Hughes had a long criminal history, which included convictions for assault, burglary, theft, criminal damage, threatening behavior, and motoring offenses, as well as possession of weapons. At the age of 16 in 1981, he lured a seven-year-old boy into an abandoned building, where, according to an arrest report, he, quote, exposed himself and made inappropriate advances. Eventually, he tried to strangle the child. Recounting the incident, the boy described, quote, He lifted me and threw me down forcefully. He was incredibly strong. He ended up on top of me, gripping my neck with both hands. The boy pretended to be dead until Hughes left. Hughes was convicted of assaulting the boy and placed under a two-year mental health supervision order. On release, Hughes returned to live with his mother, recently separated from his father. Following his release, he became increasingly aggressive and violent in nature, picking fights with people at random. His disruptive behavior led to an inability to maintain any job. 
Despite his father offering him various roles within his business over the years, Hughes declined to contribute in any capacity. Instead, he caused damage to machinery and engaged in altercations with fellow employees. Hughes had also been accused of assaulting young girls aged 3, 5, and 9 in the years between his release and 1995. Hughes came under suspicion when multiple witnesses spotted him cycling along a path which overlooked Sophie's location. One woman actually caught him hiding in the bushes, and he told her he was looking for money he had dropped. The path's proximity to the property meant that he could potentially overhear the children's conversations, which indicated that he may have been aware they were sleeping in the garden that night. Moreover, that night, at 2.55 a.m., Hughes was seen sitting on a bench near the promenade by a police officer who talked to him while patrolling the town. The police later discovered a shoe print on a rhubarb leaf in the Jones's garden, which upon examination indicated a potential match with Hughes's shoe. Hughes was arrested at the home he shared with his mother at 3.50 p.m. on the same day the body was discovered. He was detained at the police station and during his questioning, he constantly denied any involvement in the murder. He confirmed that he roamed all over the area, including having been on the bridal path that ran behind the Joneses' house that day he also confirmed that he was out and about in the early hours of July 30th when he was spoken to by a police officer. However, he denied killing Sophie. He was held for four days, but as there was not enough evidence to charge him, he was released from prison. Hughes was soon rearrested after police found indeed images of children, which had been located in a police search of his home. Officers had also found a collection of girls' undergarments hidden in a stone wall. Soon, other evidence came to light, albeit circumstantial. A six-year-old girl named Amanda Roberts came forward to say that she had been playing in a park near her home that Saturday afternoon when she was approached by Hughes at around 4 p.m. He tried to persuade her to go with him, but the girl ran away. That park was less than a four-minute cycle ride from the Joneses' house. A convicted sex offender, Michael Guidi, also came forward. He claimed to have known Hughes and his mother while he was a neighbor of theirs. He told police that Hughes would often share his twisted sexual fantasies about assaulting young girls with him. He said that there was more than one occasion when they had a conversation and that he said that he wanted to abduct a girl to have intercourse with her and then to murder her. Police allowed Hughes's father to visit in response to his request for welfare visits. During that visit, Hughes reportedly confessed to sexually assaulting and murdering Sophie. Hughes also told his father the route that he had taken when he kidnapped Sophie. Hughes' father, after learning the truth, told police that his son had confessed to the murder during their visit. He also gave information to the police concerning the location of the child's clothes. Sophie's night clothes were later found in the area indicated. Howard Hughes was officially charged with the kidnapping and murder of Sophie Hook. On the 24th of June, 1996, his trial began. Only Christopher Hook and Danny Jones attended the trial as they did not want Julie and their children to be re-traumatized. There was no forensic evidence linking Hughes to the crime, but the jury heard the testimony of three witnesses, one being Hughes's own father. He addressed the court and spoke of how his son had confided to him that he had murdered Sophie. His father told the court that when he went to visit his son in jail, he told him, quote, if I'm going to stay in this room with you, I must know if you did it. His son then allegedly broke down and admitted, quote, I did it. Howard Hughes described how, on that Saturday morning, he went to the Joneses' back garden where the children were preparing for the party. He said, quote, I went back there at about two in the morning. I persuaded a girl to go with me down to the beach. The girl started screaming and I put my hand over her mouth and kept it there until she stopped. I took off all her clothes and threw her body into the sea. He followed up his statement by saying, quote, 
I've been sexually frustrated since 1990. Hughes later went on to deny this confession. The defense argued that his confession may not have actually been to her murder, but only in an effort, he said, to help authorities find Sophie's clothing. To which his father said, quote, you can suggest what you like, but that is rubbish. The second witness was Jonathan Carroll, a 30-year-old career criminal who was in prison at the time he testified. He told the jury that he had been out looking for places to rob. He was in a garden when he heard someone coming up the street. A few moments later, he saw Hughes carrying a sack down a lane. He then says he caught a glimpse of a human leg coming out of the sack. The third witness was Michael Guidi, who told the jury how Hughes had previously confessed about the twisted sexual fantasies he had regarding assaulting young girls. In addition to these witnesses, the court heard the statement of the witnesses who placed Hughes at the bridal path on July 29th, as well as the statement of Alexandra Roberts, whom Hughes tried to lure later that day. The court rejected any suggestions that Sophie accompanied Hughes willingly. Sophie's mother, Julie, said in a written statement that she and her husband had consistently taught Sophie the significance of avoiding strangers. Julie further mentioned that her daughter was cautious around strangers and would not have gone with Hughes independently. There was speculation that Hughes forcibly took Sophie from the tent, and it is conceivable that when Hughes initially lifted Sophie, she believed it was her mother or father, and by the time she realized it was not, it was too late. Hughes vehemently denied any involvement in the seven-year-old's murder. He refuted ever having a conversation with Michael Guidi and denied confessing to his father, alleging that his father had made up a pack of lies to get Hughes away from the area. When asked about Sophie's clothing, he claimed that he found the nightdress by the side of a road about half a mile from the house, close to a derelict property. He said he picked it up with the intention of using it as a substitute for toilet paper. He did not use the nightdress for this, but carried it for a while before throwing it away over a hedge. Prosecutors alleged that Hughes had gone to great lengths to ensure that there was no forensic connection between himself and the body. They told the court that he had shaved off his pubic hair before the murder to ensure that there was no forensic connection between himself and Sophie. Hughes was known to wear the same jacket for months on end without ever washing it. However, he reportedly had it laundered after the murder. On the 18th of July in 1996, the jury returned a guilty verdict on all three charges against Howard Hughes. The 31-year-old was then given three life sentences. The judge, Mr. Justice Curtis, recommended that he should never be released from prison. On the 24th of November in 2002, it was announced that he would have to serve a minimum imprisonment of 50 years before consideration for parole. This ruling has enabled Hughes to be eligible for release in 2045 at the age of 80. Following Sophie's death, a brass plaque was erected on the beach in her memory. After her murder, Sophie's family felt terrible guilt about her death. Julie condemned the killer as, quote, the most evil and horrendous monster in the world. She said, quote, I just feel numb, totally and utterly numb. I think most people believe in good. It is very difficult to comprehend that somebody could be so evil. I protected my children so much. They were not allowed to cross the road on their own. We both feel very, very sorry that the one time she needed us most, we were simply not there for her. That feeling will never go away. If you like what we do and want to see more, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Thank you so much to our patrons. If you would like to support this channel, you can visit the link in our bio below. 